We're on. Well, we're live from the Toby Family Auditorium at the Commonwealth Club of California. It's a special program today to basically help you help yourself during these uh, very odd times. Now, unless you're one of our small but mighty audio and video team here in the room with me, you're watching this program from your home or office. Uh, you might be working from home or you might unfortunately be laid off as we know millions of people have been. Um, but you're spending a lot of time either alone or with family, hopefully that means with loved ones. Um, and we wanted to get into things you can do, things you can watch, undiscovered gems, all these things that will make this time more enjoyable, maybe more edifying, but certainly more enjoyable and uh, give you a little less reason to watch uh, talking heads on the news tell you about uh, contagion and stuff like that. Um, let me introduce our distinguished panel of TV and media critics. Today we have joining us from Kansas City, Aaron Barnhart. He's a TV critic for Prime Timer. He's a former TV critic for the Kansas City Star, and he's the author of, among other works, Hunker Down TV, which is about just what you think it is, and Tasteland. You can follow him on Twitter at TV Barn Again. So welcome, Aaron. Thanks, John. Uh, and also up here in the Bay Area with me is Ingu Kang. She's a TV critic for The Hollywood Reporter, former chief TV critic for MTV News, and a former TV critic for The Village Voice. She's on Twitter at Ingu Kang. So welcome, Ingu. Hi, thanks for having me. And another Californian is Michael Snyder. He is a print and broadcast pop culture journalist. He does uh, Michael Snyder's Culture Blast, which you can find on GabNet.net, Roku, Spotify, and YouTube. He's a film reviewer and columnist at large at the Marina Times. And he's also a screenwriter, movie and TV reviewer on the Mark Thompson Show here on KGO Radio 810. You can follow him on Twitter at Culture Blaster. So, Michael, welcome. Nice to be here, pal. So this hour, I want to pick your brains about the TV shows and maybe movies um, that you think people might want to consider watching during this time. Uh, but first, let me just check in with each of you. How are you doing in this shelter-in-place world? And are you spending your time binge-watching stuff, or is that too much like work into uh, your, your uh, personal life? Maybe start with you, Inga. Um. Unfortunately, this coronavirus quarantine is what I have been building my career toward um, <laughs> because I work from home. I am home pretty much all day uh, and I'm sitting at home watching television and thinking about television. Um, and that was all right. That was all for years before the quarantine. Um, I am still at work and unfortunately, not, or fortunately, nothing has really changed about my job right now. Um, and so I'm more than hanging in there, a lot luckier than a lot of other people. Good to hear. Michael, how about you? Well, I don't mind being around the house uh, with the laptop, my very best friend. Uh, but insofar as I go to a lot of screenings, I go to you know dance clubs, I go to uh, uh, live performances, music stuff, and art galleries, uh, I feel a little ill at ease. Let's put it this way. Cabin fever? No, because I have my laptop. Uh, and the other fact is that, you know, I watch a lot of streaming movies for review purposes, and I do watch a lot of prestige television, which we talk about on KGO occasionally. And so, you know, I'm making do. The big thing for me is the horror of a safari to the grocery store. And um, I'm, I've got to get the right bandana because I certainly don't want to take one of those uh, surgical masks away from a health worker. And then you've got to deal with the, the lunatics in your neighborhood. But other than that, everything has been okay. I've tried to keep focused on uh, what's really right, which is staying in touch with friends via electric mm -hmm. media, our phones and such, and enjoying what we have to, to enjoy uh, via the internet. Very good. Aaron, how about you? Uh, well, John, I'm with Michael and Ingu in the sense that my uh, life and work kind of revolves around uh, my my work here at home. Um, we did uh, uh, recently change offices, and so I went from the the bottom floor to the third floor. So that's been been kind of nice, and we were able to uh, get that done. But I think uh, for me, the big adjustment, 
And the thing that I'm still kind of struggling with is just this infusion of, of news and kind of like just every day there's just grim reports coming in. And as much as you think you're going to be kind of prepared for it, every day there's just some other gut punch. I mean, today it was Ellis Marsalis. Uh, who is just, you know, uh, uh, who I once had the, you know, Diane and I had the privilege of seeing him perform in New Orleans and, um, you know, great man and carried away by this awful uh, coronavirus. So I think for me, um, the real uh, difficult thing is just putting all that aside and focusing on my work. Um, and then um, hopefully we can get into this a bit, but I think that one reason you, if, if you hear people talking about television right now, they're, they're using the word escapism a lot, you know, and I think whether it's trying to get back to some routine of work or looking for something at the end of a long day of absorbing bad news, um, that's really kind of the, the, the cultural tonal change that's going on right now. People are just looking to get away from it all and escape to, to something, at least for a short time. Well, great. We're going to get into, I mean, television series, television specials, documentaries, movies. Um, but let's start with television series. And maybe Michael, I mean, okay, someone's at home. What, what's something they can dig into that, let's start with maybe something that, that is a classic. That, you know, it's probably all available on one service or another. I mean, what, what, what would you recommend? They, what are some recommendations you'd have? Well, a lot of people make jokes about this because of the subtitle situation. But um, there are things out there from other countries. And I just want to lead with this because I'm so enamored of it. There is a German series called Babylon Berlin. That's great is set during the Weimar Republic and it's a mystery and it's a cultural, uh, cultural investigation. It's decadence. It's uh, society. And uh, you see what's coming down the road, but throughout it all, there is this kind of sense. If you watched or are familiar with cabaret, the movie or the, or the uh, stage play, the musical, this is the dark underbelly of, of even that. And it is, not only beautifully art directed and beautifully written and beautifully acted, it's directed with such panache. And, uh, you know, they have a third season that just dropped on Netflix. So you could chew over that for a little while. And I don't want to seem to be like, you know, Mr. Subtitle snob, but that's something I think people could really get caught up in. And, um, you know, there are other things that are maybe coming down the pike. Uh, if you watch the wonderful, um, miniseries Liar a couple years ago starring Joanne Froggett, who people know mostly as a maid and a beloved one on Upstairs, Downstairs, excuse me, on um, Downton Abbey. Uh, Liar is uh, fantastic uh, and, uh, and feminist in its way, drama about a woman who is basically raped and tries to prove that her accuser did this and they've moved on to a second series that's just coming out now. And in another week or so, it's going to start running on American television. So um, there are things from overseas that, that I really love, but the truth is at this point in time, you would do worse than to just start watching classic sitcoms like um, Seinfeld or uh, maybe even get back to the beginning of uh, the Good Place, which is a recent show that's just exquisite and, and will make you laugh and will make you choke up. Uh, and it's finished its run. And it's not drama per se. It's comic and you'll laugh. But it's such a wise piece of work about the human condition with um, maybe the best performance of Danson's career, I think, in a lot of ways. It, it outstrips everything else he's ever done. And the great Kristen Bell is one of the leads. And The Good Place is something I think people can, I'm not going to say rediscover because it just ended its run on NBC, but it's such a lovely journey. And it's, it's uplifting and sweet and worth people's time. Maybe you'll get their minds off the crap they're dealing with right now. And, and give, briefly describe what the, the plot or the setting of The Good Place is. Oh, The Good Place, yeah. Uh, a bunch of uh, kind of questionable people die and find themselves apparently in heaven, but it's not all that it seems. And I swear to God, it's a comedy and, um, and it's a, it could get a little on the, uh, on the right side here and there in terms of them not pulling punches, but 
yeah, it's it's it addresses matters of life and death, and yet it's wonderfully funny and wonderfully life affirming. Uh, and uh, these four people meet one another in the good place, which is apparently where you go after you die. And they may not have been properly directed to the good place. They may have better served been a uh, better service sent elsewhere to the bad place, to purgatory. But there they are, and we have to come to grips with that as a viewer, and they have to deal with it. Uh, basically, uh, for eternity, and it's pretty wonderful. Very good, Aaron. You're nodding your head. I know a couple of those shows are in your Hunker Down TV booklet, which, by the way, people can download f- or, or get free. Yes. Where should they go to to, to find that? Uh, easiest place is to go to um, my uh, website, TVBarn.com. TVs and television. Barn is in Barnhart. Uh, yeah, there. Those are those are a couple of great ones. You know, whenever you're asking people to commit to series TV today, that's that's um, you, you do so with some trepidation, right? Uh, uh, our, our old friend, Tim Goodman, uh, former, uh, critic at the Hollywood reporter where, where Ingu is, uh, said that, uh, people, uh, that series now s- start to stress people out, right? People just get stressed when they turn to their watch list and see a show that's got a hundred episodes. So it's, just give me something I can watch in a weekend. But and, isn't like now the point where you exactly. watch shows that are like two thousand episodes long because you exactly the time? that's so so now really is the time to jump on these things. So Michael named a couple of good ones. Um, there there's some that have just started out this season that are worth investing in as well. Um, and most of these are available on Hulu. Uh, I think of the uh, the ABC series For Life, which is kind of like a, it's a it's a courtroom procedural, but it's told it's it's about um, a guy who's been wrongfully convicted, who through some machinations um, that have been cooked up mostly in a Hollywood screenwriter's head, um, is able to try cases in the courtroom and exonerate other wrongfully convicted people while working on his own case. So it's sort of like revenge on the whole courtroom genre in a way, uh, but it is based on a real person's life. Uh, and 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 that's that's a great little tale. Um, also on ABC is uh, what I call the PTSD bisexual uh, a, uh, remake of the Rockford Files, uh, which is a, a show called Stumptown, um, uh, was to- starring Colby Smulders and uh, based on a graphic novel series. Uh, that's that's very good. Um, you know, if you go over on the neck uh, and and the one other one that's on on that started this season that I really strongly recommend is Mixedish, which is the prequel to Blackish set in the 1980s. Um, and it's this culture clash between these uh, r- r- rainbow from uh, um, uh, Tracy Blackish. Ellis Ross's character from 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 Blackish. Her her parents were hippies who dropped out of Berkeley to become part of a hippie commune. And and then they were kind of unceremoniously kicked out of that and had to go live with his dad, who's a Ronald Reagan supporting uh, conservative lawyer. And so it's this, but it's just this really well scripted uh, comedy with great chemistry. And in a way it kind of feels like an 80s sitcom. Like there's always a moral at the end of the story. And of course it weaves in a lot of 80s culture. But at the same time, it's a way of looking back at the not too distant past through 21st century eyes. And and then at a certain time in the show, it turns around and now the 80s kind of look forward at us and kind of and make us kind of think about our own assumptions. I, it's just a, it's for for kind of a slapdash 19 minute sitcom um, with some politically incorrect laugh lines to it. I, I think it's it's really well done. Um, on the on the Hulu side, I just want to just very quickly say, um, jumping on Michael's point about series television coming over from other countries, which is a real kind of a recent development, and Netflix gets a lot of credit for driving that. Um, they've got a comedy called Dairy Girls, which you can watch in a weekend, and it's the biggest show in Northern Ireland. It's just it's set all again in the '90s during the Troubles in Northern Ireland and Belfast, and it's just this raunchy teenage uh, working class Irish family sitcom with a Catholic school. And then sort of the troubles are hanging hanging over all of it because it takes place pre Good Friday Accord, uh, Ireland. Um, these, the, uh, so there's a lot of series to discover, um, of course, and, and a lot of the new streaming services are going to be hanging their hat on 
things like uh, friends in the office, knowing that 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 you know a good series can be comfort food for a generation of viewers. Okay, I think it's interesting that both Michael and Aaron recommended shows that are set in the past because I certainly have been also finding myself much more enamored of shows that take place in the past. Um, I think maybe partly because the times are so dire or they feel so uncertain. And I think knowing that other people in different times of history also had to deal with some incredibly terrible situations has been weirdly comforting. Um, I think as soon as the uh, shelter in place policy uh, took pl effect in the Bay Area, I read Jeffrey Tubin's American Heiress, which is sort of a recounting of the uh, Patty Hearst saga. And I thought to myself, well, like this is a terrible time that we're living in, but we don't also have like, I don't know, the melting down of American civil society alongside two serial killers who are running around the city alongside this like completely <laughs> mysterious group who is terrorizing uh, rich people, which I guess like isn't always the worst thing. Um, <laughs> all of which is like a very long preamble to say, I think that the show that I would recommend in this vein is HBO's My Brilliant Friend, which is an adaptation of Elena Ferrante's Neapolitan novels. And basically, uh, they follow two girls who meet in something like kindergarten or first grade. One of them gets to continue her education. The other one is sort of forced by her impoverished parents to quit school. And essentially the girl who is the, uh, the girl who is forced to quit school is the smartest girl in town. And the girl who is allowed to continue her education is the second smartest girl. And the second smartest girl sort of uh, gets to do these like very wondrous things and move out of her small town and just has like an extraordinarily uh, rich life that the uneducated girl who is possibly more intelligent doesn't get to. And so the novels take place over the course of their lifetimes. Um, so far, the TV show ha has two seasons. The first one is about their childhoods, which at least for me was a little bit Less interesting, I think, because it's harder for me to relate to children. Um, but the second season, which is currently on the air, is about their uh, teenage lives and their young adulthood. And uh, the show is really brilliant in its set design because it takes place in uh, post-war, completely broken Naples, Italy. And you slowly see the town... Uh, develop around them as Italy reconstructs itself. And also uh, parts of the show take place on the island of Ischia off the Amalfi coast. So if you need like a little vacation, there is nothing more gorgeous than that island. And that is the first place I'm going to go to whenever we are able to get back on planes. <laughs> Uh, that's a, uh, can, if I could just add uh, one that's not from the past, because uh, uh, Ingu's point is exactly right. Uh, I guess we'd be remiss if we didn't mention a serial that's uh, set in uh, the technical, uh, the, the some, some sort of techno future. And, th and that's the new uh, FX series, Devs, uh, which um, is simulcasting this new arrangement uh, where, where FX, a cable channel, is sort of transitioning into becoming a streaming channel um, because um, I think everybody sort of sees that that that's kind of the future. So FX is now co-launching on Hulu, which I don't know. Four people, shows. Yeah. Pe people, well, certain shows. Yeah. But I think people are sort of, I uh, haven't maybe realized that Disney owns both Hulu and Disney plus and is sort of positioning Hulu, I think is the grown up uh, uh, Disney streaming channel and Disney plus is the, the old kids. So FX is really, it's a great, Match for it and this dev series, which stars Nick Offerman as this shaggy, um, entrepreneurial, you know, Silicon Valley type genius CEO with this big secret in his backyard. This this technology he's working on, which essentially can uh, will will when they perfect it, des destroy the notion of, that human beings have free will um, and that we can predict human actions in the future. This. 
Um, this is a really some some big ideas floating around, but at the heart of it is just an old fashioned uh, murder conspiracy theory. Some just some some great writing on this show, um, and it's just launched on FX and FX on Hulu. So this is a great time to sort of absorb yourself into a, a serial that's that's ongoing now. And it's not Which brings to mind. It's funny the devs is pretty wonderful, and you've just pushed me to think about and to uh, extrapolate a little bit. And that would be to say that this would be a great time for people to get into Westworld if they haven't before. Oh, yeah. you have two seasons to actually binge so you can hold on to some of these wonderful puzzle-like complexities as the show rolls on into the second season. And the third season is just starting on HBO. And the facts are that it's very much in tune with the themes of devs uh, and also something uh, to um, warm your heart, it seems a little more linear in its storytelling. So for people who have had problems with series one and two and watch them uh, on a week by week basis, by all means, continue the, the uh, continue on the road because it's it, to me, it's a wonderful piece of work. And uh, just a quick jump back to my brilliant friend, my brother and his wife and youngest daughter live in Naples right now and are undergoing one of the biggest lockdowns in the world. Uh, my brother needs papers to get to his job. And uh, it's so amazing to watch my brilliant friend and see this reconstruction going on and then realize what's happening right now. Um, I'm also a big fan of my brilliant friend and uh, I haven't watched all of series two, but I'm very um, caught up in it. And uh, you know, it, it couldn't be more relevant to my life and my family's life than something said in Naples. Uh, and you know, pretty, pretty wonderful drama. The, the kids in the first series, uh, say what you will about dealing with children or watching kids, young actors that just blew me away. They were, they were terrific. The two girls. And they were first time actors, which is, I think, even more astounding. That'll, um, you know, that'll definitely um, intrigue a lot of people. And again, I beg of you, get over any kind of reluctance to watch subtitled television, because if you do, you uh, if you're not into it, you're going to be missing out on so much out there. But, you know, at the same time, we have plenty of things in the English language that we can enjoy. You know, it's there's a lot of stuff out there. By, by the way, this is uh, uh, just because you mentioned it a couple of times. Uh, very rapidly, uh, especially among millennials, subtitles have become kind of like the curb cuts of television, that thing that was designed for a handicap group, but which turns out to benefit everybody. And so I've, I've heard a lot of people who say that they turn subtitles just on any show just because it helps them focus. And then the, and then the thing we do in our house, because my wife has low vision, we always watch Netflix and any other services like Apple TV Plus uh, that offer it, audio description. So this is um, in a little gaps in the dialogue, a voice come, uh, uh, a narrator comes in and kind of explains certain discrete details that uh, would not be obvious to the un to the person lacking uh, sight uh, or who's visually visually impaired in some way. And I know a lot of people, including myself, I find this very beneficial just to have on regardless because it turns out the narrator catches a lot of details that I, as the viewer, you know, miss like. Um, they'll identify characters by name in the audio descriptions. And it, it, it helps me uh, focus as well. So that's a little pro tip for me. That would have been helpful with something like Game of Thrones because yes. I was always like, which 70th old man is this? I do not understand <laughs> what's sure. going on. Well, I, I don't want to go I don't want to go crazy about this, but it would really be helpful for anybody who watches the German sci-fi drama Dark, which has so many generations and so many characters that from their youth to their uh, old age and the relationships keep changing and, and are in flux. So yeah, I, that, that would be amazing. It's not enough that you've got to read the subtitles for dark. I usually have a Wikipedia concordance of uh, characters to, to the side so I can kind of make sure I know who I'm watching and you know, I'm, I'm not hearing or visually impaired uh, and I'm telling you uh, dark is that complex, but that worthwhile. And that's another uh, show that might be, uh, beneficial to to binge to watch in order uh, because man it's a uh, tangled web and what service is dark on where would people find that i think you can find it on netflix i'm sure you can actually and it's got two seasons and those of us who are fans of the show and i'm not alone 
are uh, breathlessly anticipating series three, which apparently I think they completed. I hope they completed prior to any lockdowns in Germany. Wow. Ingu, we were talking before about uh, shows that had some historical setting, whether it was a long time ago or a couple decades ago. When you're watching something like that, how, how important is the accuracy of it? You know, if you went to see a movie with my dad and there was a car that was in the movie that was uh, actually that one came out in 1955, but this movie is set in 1954. They should have caught that. <laughs> does that drive you crazy? Does that does that do you just kind of go with it? And does it matter maybe on the type of show? I mean, happy days if they got the 50s wrong, who cares? Um, Not to throw my youth in everyone's face, but <laughs> if it's set in a place that is before 1995, I probably <laughs> won't notice. Um, my apologies. So that's my answer. It doesn't really bother me. I think yeah. um, if I think it would depend if there was like a weird narrative choice, but I also think that kind of nitpicking is, I don't know, why distract yourself from like a really great story by focusing on little tiny details that like may or may not be there for important reasons, really. This is a, it me something... whenever I see Fonzie with a cell phone though, honestly, that's really, <laughs> no, but this is something that we've been talking about actually uh, uh, in, uh, in prime timer uh, is these shows that are inspired by texts. Now they're no longer based on they're inspired by. Mm -hmm. And uh, what that really means is that they optioned the book and then the writer thumb through it a few times and then they threw it in the trash and they, they wrote something else. I mean, the, 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 the there's a been several of these coming out and to me, the, a series that just aired on Netflix called unorthodox is a prime example of this. This is based on a memoir of a woman who escaped an ultra Orthodox community and went touring Europe for a while. And then she came back to the United States. Um, and there's been some questions about whether she was completely forthright uh, with her own printed memoir, but the TV show, which is written by a couple of, 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 of German screenwriters who've done a lot of good shows over, over in Germany, bears no resemblance to it at all. Um, the week before that, I reviewed a show called Self Made, based uh, inspired by the life of Madam C.J. Walker, which stars Octavia Spencer as uh, one of the pioneering women in black uh, hair care products in the early Don't watch 1900s. It. Uh, and it's just like this has nothing to do with the story of Madam C.J. Walker. If you if you drill down to it, and yes, uh, this this uh, Ingu is right. This has been very polarizing show with uh, some people enjoying it and some people really really hating it. Go ahead, but I think that creative license is fine, and I think with something like Madam C.J. Walker, it's a bad show. But it's not a bad show because it's historically inaccurate. It's a bad show because it goes for too many different things in its bid to make it relevant to the modern day audience. I think like the very first scene of the miniseries is basically Octavia Spencer in character as Madam C.J. Walker, who was born, you know, like a few years after uh, emancipation and essentially she's in boxing gear she's in like a satin robe she has boxing gloves she's about to go uh punch her opponent who is yes. actually her business rival and i think that if you had a scene like that where it's a modern departure and it's and it works and it's not like a bludgeon to the head type of metaphor where she's a fighter like okay we get it um i think uh, that's fine. I think one of the really fun things about a lot of historically set shows these days, shows and movies, is when they do have really modern um, connections or touches. Yes. I think one example that I will talk about is the upcoming series, This is America, which is about the attempt to pass the ERA. It uh, was greenlit at Hulu. Sorry, it was greenlit at FX, but it is going to debut uh, on Hulu in two weeks. And essentially, uh, instead of one like core character that we truly follow, it gives uh, the center stage 
to various characters or various uh, historical personages in the second wave movement. And so there's Phyllis Schlafly, who of course is the a uh, woman who is trying to destroy all of those second wavers. But there's Gloria Steinem, there's Bella Abzug, there's um, Betty Friedan. And essentially, I think that one of the great things about the show is that the show makes it very obvious why we currently are in the midst of the culture wars that we are yes. now and how Schlafly has all of these like weird eerie connections to Trump. Like they both lie about crowd size. They both lie about their familiarity with the Bible. And I think that, you know, something like that can be useful. And so I don't think that historical accuracy, I mean, I think it just depends on how skilled the writer is. Well, and we're talking about a show, of course, John, that's going to debut in a couple of weeks, uh, I believe March 15th, but really worth marking on your calendar because he goes, right, this is a terrific production. And I would actually push back a little bit against the uh, historical creative license as somebody who and, and uh, came from kind of more conservative side of the tracks and spent uh, a lot of time kind of uh, in that in that movement at, at, at some point in my long and storied career, uh, I really thought that this was a quite sympathetic portrayal of Phyllis Schlafly and just the whole pushback against the ERA. Um, she is, uh, and um, I also have to say that on the other side, the portrayal of Bella Obzug by Margot Martindale is just, I mean, even by Margot Martindale standards, this it is a superb performance and really shows a woman who is just trying to use the brute force of her power in the U.S. Congress to get things done. And so she's kind of an interesting triangulation point between these two women who each lead their respective sides, uh, Phyllis Schlafly, the, the anti-Gloria uh, Steinem, the pro, and then she's also trying to actually move this legislation through. Um, and, and a good uh, it, it, while you're waiting for that, if you haven't watched the RBG film uh, the documentary, uh, Notorious RBG, uh, that that's actually a good thing to, that goes with it because it also shows how at the same time in the legislative branch, uh, in the I'm sorry, in the judicial branch, uh, uh, Councillor Ginsburg was trying to get um, the women's rights uh, agenda uh, moved as well. There was one Just other one. Oh, okay, Just to add ahead. one extra point. There is like a, I don't know, a five second cameo by a younger uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg in <laughs> Mrs. America. And instead of being the, you know, uh, icon essentially that we know today, she's this sort of like more, she's this meeker, shyer person, which really tells you how far she herself has advanced as a person and in her career, but also the era that we were living in where a lot of these the women who are now powerhouses didn't really have the voice that they do now back then because they were so growing as people. And so I think that's just like another extra little touch in terms of make drawing connections to the modern day. Yeah. Um, it's funny you brought this up because honestly, um, the idea of being true to history and at the same time resonating in the current day is never more obvious than uh, in the deliberately alternate history of the plot against America, which is Took the words out of my mouth. Currently on HBO, uh, an adaptation of the Philip Roth novel that uh, suggests what might have happened had Franklin Delano Roosevelt not won his last presidency and instead lost to a populist figure, a celebrity, Charles Lindbergh, uh, in 1940 in that presidential election. And Lindbergh, who was well known to be um, a uh, let's call him um, a Nazi sympathizer, or at least uh, you can call him a Nazi sympathizer. Yeah, he was not an, 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 <laughs> an anti-Semite and an anti-Semite uh, gets the presidency and the uh, course of history uh, and certainly the course of the United States uh, and its history is irrevocably changed. And the show uh, basically focuses uh, on an extended Jewish family, uh, including as two sisters, uh, the wonderful Zoe Kazan and the uh, the back on the beam Winona Ryder, both doing excellent work. And uh, John Turturro's on the show as a rabbi who's clearly collaborating with the Lindbergh administration 
And the use of archival footage, the fantastic, I, I was raving about Babylon Berlin's art direction. The art direction and the way they shoot uh, the plot against America uh, is wonderful. And as someone who, who loves, you know, alternate history, sci-fi, uh, you know, that sort of stuff, uh, the plot against America was right in my wheelhouse. And it's, I guess, up to episode three or four. And it certainly um, suggests that you can diverge from historical fact to get something really potent. And, and the uh, obvious connection we can make with the, uh, our current, uh, shall we say, celebrity president and uh, whether he's fit for duty, uh, all of that is, is made evident and maybe punched up a little bit for some people's tastes, but I was very much caught up. Yeah. In it. And you know, I was, I was going to go there too. And the only thing I would add to that is that David Simon says, but remember Lindbergh was a hero. And that is a big difference between uh, 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 then and now. And yeah. But talk about a guy who's absolutely committed to building a world that is uh, authentic and feels true. Um, and, and remember, it, he, at a certain point, he begins you know, pivoting away from history. And yet you just, you just feel like you're being transported into an America that actually existed. In 1941, and Lindbergh is, is uh, David elected. Simon. David Simon is one of the people behind this, and uh, he's uh, had a, he's got a great track record. Yeah. Um, it, by the way, we've been talking about so far. We've been talking about Netflix and Hulu uh, mostly. We should mention um, that uh, Apple TV Plus is out there. They're not putting out a lot of content, and their uh, their output's been been uh, pretty uneven. But they do have um, a, a a couple shows to recommend and along this line one of them I, I highly recommend is Little America and this is based on a series of stories originally commissioned for an online journal called Epic um, and it was sort of a collaborative deal between the, the, the online publication and the producers of this Apple TV Plus show but basically each one of them is a story about uh, the immigrant experience sometime in the last, I would say, five to 30 years. Um, so, um, and, and the stories are kind of intentionally chosen for their, 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 sm their smallness. The, these are, these are bite-sized stories, humble stories, but stories that in some way or another um, uh, really remind you of, of why people come here and how, despite all of the hardships and the very, very real difficulties people face, um, integrating into American life, the, particularly the, the shock that they have that the streets aren't paved with gold and things just don't immediately go swimmingly for them. Um, how, and, and a lot of them turn back, uh, how you get some really, in, some really inspiring outcomes and you're really reminded of the reason, uh, whether it's a, this girl who is a troubled, you know, is getting in trouble in her inner city high, high school until in San Diego, until one day she discovers uh, squash uh, for uh, a racquetball at the local racquetball, white person's racquetball club, or whether it's a, a, an African national who um, goes to graduate school at, in Oklahoma and finally wins some acceptance when he dresses up like a cowboy. Uh, the, and, and every episode is told a little bit differently. There's one where Tw you're 28 minutes in and you're still not sure who the immigrant is in it. So really some beautifully told little stories. Um, and since so many people are now getting Apple TV plus one year subscriptions when they buy an iPhone or uh, buy a new um, Apple product of any kind, I think a lot of people who are watching this probably have, have access to Apple TV plus content. And um, it, that, that certainly shouldn't be um, uh, overlooked. Uh, in this discussion either. Go ahead. I would really like to plug one other Apple TV Plus show, which I think is the best Apple TV um, show so far. Little America is a second best. Mm -hmm. The first best is a documentary about TV and the queer representation called The Visible. Um, I think the subtitle is something like Out on Television. Yes. And the... Premise, I think maybe if you're not super familiar, I wasn't that super familiar with the history of television. 
uh, it sounds a little hokey because you think it'll start at Will and Grace and sort of like go to Pose or something. It actually starts all the way uh, back to the 1950s. And it's not only about uh, representation on regular um, scripted television, but also about sports and also about news and the way that some activists went and sort of, I think um, either like on behalf of queer acceptance or for um, the fight for uh, AIDS awareness would come into newscasters studios and disrupt the programs. I mean, it's just, even for someone that's obsessed, obsessed with television as I am, I learned an incredible amount. And a lot of these uh, stories about television are interspersed with stories um, by real people about um, real people that you know through television, like Tim Gunn or Wilson Cruz. And they tell their own stories about their own experiences. Tim Gunn has one of those stories where if you listen to it and you don't cry like you just you're there's something wrong with your tear ducts but in any case uh visible is one of those tinier shows that i feel like i have been uh recommending to everyone that i meet and because everyone has been so busy no one pays it any mind and one of my hopes for this quarantine time is that you know if you need to watch something like cheers or friends or the office something really really nostalgic and comfort foodie i absolutely get it but if you sort of want to use this time where we're all where we are all forced to watch tv and you want to do a little bit more digging around to see maybe what hidden gems you might have missed uh visible i just cannot recommend enough i am i'm going to put in a plug for one other tiny show that i feel like has been sort of off the radar um unfairly which is a showtime comedy called work in progress and it the premise just sounds absolutely loony where you have a <laughs> middle-aged lesbian who is suicidal and she says to herself I'm just going to give myself a set amount of time I think it's something like three months or six months to live and basically a co-worker at her temp office uh, gives her a bunch of almonds and tells her you should lose weight by eating almonds and so she takes these almonds she puts out sorry, I forget, 60 or 90 of them, like puts one in the trash every day and sort of says like, if stuff in my uh, life don't look up, then I'm just going to kill myself, which I know sounds really dire and like the last thing that you want to watch in these like very terrible times. But it's also like an incredibly funny show. And of course, there's a love interest and the love interest is just so utterly romantic in a way that like, I think a lot of ways we have not really seen before. Yeah, and and, and it is inspired by uh, or based on the life of of, of a real woman who's uh, the 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 Chicago um, comic. Improv co comic at the at the center and the creator of this show, work in progress. Yes, I think her name is Abby. Ooh, I should know this, Abby Mc. Okay, well you she's, can look. She's it up. former. She's former Second City. I know that. That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, Work in Progress is a show that I hope people will sort of figure out how to watch. It is on Showtime, which means that it is available um, via their on-demand site, Showtime Anytime. That, that gets into something that, that we have these discussions in our office from time to time when someone will come over and start talking about some great show they're watching on Netflix. I don't have Netflix. I tend to stream stuff through uh, Google Play, Xfinity, uh, and Prime, Amazon Prime. Um, so, on the other hand, like Michael, I'm a science fiction geek. I hear all these things about Star Trek Picard. And I'm like, well, is it worth subscribing to that? Or are all these things eventually going to then be released on the other platforms? Michael, what are your thoughts? It's funny. Yeah, it's funny that um, Ingu brought up um, Wilson Cruz, because if you do get CBS All Access, you can see Wilson Cruz and Anthony Rapp as one of the most uh, straight up, and straight isn't the word, uh, married couples on television. Uh, they are both on the Starship Discovery uh, in this um, strange 
prequel and and uh, I guess eventually this coming season's sequel to every Star Trek show that we know other than Enterprise. Uh, this is uh, Star Trek Discovery on CBS All Access, along with Star Trek Card, is set 10 years prior, roughly 10 years prior to the original series that featured, of course, William Shatner as um, Captain James T. Kirk. And uh, it, it's more adventures and such. And the first season, not great. But in the second season, they encounter the Enterprise roughly 10 years before the show that we all know from the 60s. And that captain, um, who uh, is Christopher Pike, and played by Anson Mount, who is now, with uh, Patrick Stewart, my favorite starship captain. The guy, Anson Mount, as Christopher Pike in Series 2 of Star Trek Discovery, is the reason to watch it, along with, admittedly, Ethan Peck, grandson of Gregory Peck, playing the young Spock as an ensign on the Enterprise prior to eventually becoming the science officer. Now, you know, it's a couple of stretches here and there. There's some uh, interesting retroactive continuity you have to do because the technology as depicted on Discovery seems to be ahead of the technology that we saw on the original series. But series two of the season two um, is, is pretty entertaining and pretty wonderful. And I say this um, in large part due to Anson Mount, but again, the supporting players, including uh, Anthony Rapp and Wilson Cruz, uh, and obviously the lead actor, Sonequa Martin-Green, uh, who people may know from The Walking Dead, playing a, a originally disgraced Starfleet officer named Michael Burnham, who turns out to have been, ready for this, Spock's adopted sister. I'm a retroactive continuity to the max. And yet, if you're into this sort of thing and you flow along with it, it's it's a ball. People have complained about uh, Star Trek Picard saying that... Uh, it doesn't have the optimism of uh, Eugene Roddenberry's Star Trek vision uh, that maybe this isn't how things would have happened, that they've had to do some kind of strange mix of um, compressed storytelling and expanded storytelling to tell a single story over 10 episodes. But it's so wonderful to be reunited with the, this character and some of the other characters from Star Trek's uh, long and storied television history that uh, I, I gave it a mulligan whenever it gave me a plot hole. I said, oh, okay, we're fine with that. <laughs> so, John, uh, I want to uh, take uh, on a point that you mentioned here when you said, uh, talked about kind of like, is it worth adding to my internet bill uh, or my credit card bill another $5.99, $6.99 a month for one more service? Or should I just wait until these things show up on Netflix? Because I think that that is, in fact, in this, this, seemingly infinite universe now of content that we've suddenly found ourselves in in the last 10 years, I think people um, want some simplicity. They want, to, they want something that's easy. And certainly, um, I, I think it's, you, it's very, very easy to see that down the road, we're not going to have the dozens and dozens of different streaming services, each of them wanting a little piece of you. Uh, at some point, there's got to be consolidation. And, and Viacom CBS, which is where these various Star, Star uh, Trek-themed shows are exclusively airing along with shows like The Good Fight, um, are basing themselves on the proposition that we've got enough here to make you want to add us to your, your uh, list of streaming services besides uh, Netflix. And we're, it's really way too early to know that. I think, I think very clearly whatever happens in the future, it's going to have a Netflix in it. Uh, it's probably going to have an HBO in it. They're going to launch their HBO now service later this year, which will take on not just the assets of HBO, but all these other Warner related properties, uh, including TBS and TNT. Uh, so that will be quite massive and we'll have some star power for it as well. And then the one that we really haven't talked about at all so far today is Disney Plus, which launched to a huge bang. And interestingly, it wasn't because they have all the Simpsons episodes or because they have all this National Geographic content or because you can watch all the, the Frozen movies as many times as your seven-year-old uh, daughter wants you to. But it had The Mandalorian, which nobody saw coming. This, this wonderfully imaginative thing out of the brain of John Favreau as a 
uh, I don't know what you even call it anymore because it's like a, it's a prequel to one, but it's a sequel to the other. Anyway, somewhere in that that Star Wars universe, and I'm sorry, Michael, but I just I don't do like these multi series series timeline tracks. But somewhere in there, right, right, right. We we have Mandalorians, and somehow they came up with this whole thing where at one point in cosmic history, Mandalorians um, were uh, bit players on spaghetti westerns because this thing is literally it's it's just like a Clint Eastwood wild wild west spaghetti western with Star Wars characters and Baby Yoda and he's, uh, he's and, a hired gun he's like a samurai essentially that's right 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 Kurosawa is factors in here as well but my point being that Disney Plus brought all this content and that content's going to be very important but to the three of us who are sitting on this panel who, you know, our, our job isn't just to watch and kind of rate TV, but kind of keep our eye on the business. And I think the question all of us had prior to the first episode of The Mandalorian is, okay, how long will people actually be willing to pay $6.99 a month for this? You know, right. but, but I think now, um, along with the move, some of the moves that Hulu is making to bring original content from FX and probably other players as well. Um, and to bundle all that along with ESPN, the suddenly irrelevant sports network um, in a $12.99 monthly bundle, you know, they look like they're in it for the long haul, that they're going to be one of those uh, survivors. But at some point, I think there's just going to be a, there's going to be a big old shakeup because even now with all this time that people have, and they're looking around for things, there's so much on Netflix and Hulu uh, to to satisfy them that uh, it's going to be it's going to be hard for those niche streaming services to to make it. Interesting. Uh, interestingly enough, if you are a Star Trek fan right now, CBS All Access does have a free month situation where you can watch and binge the already existing three series: the first two of uh, Discovery and Picard. Of course, this third Discovery series isn't going to start till late in that month, or maybe not until after your month, but uh, it'll give you a taste, and you can check it out for free and get up to speed on it. Meanwhile, another uh, service we haven't mentioned at all is Amazon Prime, uh, and if you are a science fiction fan and you do want something to binge, and it's something very complex and perhaps the best hard science fiction on television... The Expanse. I thought you were going to say that. Yes, created by created by two guys that work with George R.R. Uh, R. Martin on the. Uh, they were, uh, I guess, associates of his, and of course, he was the creator of the Game of Thrones uh, Fire and Ice series. And uh, the Expanse is it's a political, uh, socio political thriller. It's a uh, shoot 'em ups in space. It's uh, uh, aliens. It's it's everything you could want, and it's. Mm -hmm attempts to do all of this in some kind of legitimate, plausible scientific manner. So people who live on an asteroid, they're developing differently because of the different gravity and the different sort of uh, air they're breathing. And I, I mean, it's a simplicity to say that it's science fiction because it's also a film noir. It's also, like I said, a political thriller. And, and uh, it's truly speculative about where things might go once we can possibly leave the bounds of this uh, terra firma. Uh, so yeah, you know, if you are a sci-fi fan and you haven't watched The Expanse, shame on you or get a hold of Amazon or I don't know what to say. You know, you know, just on that one one note, um, I, I I've loved the books that that from The Expanse came from, and of course, one of the pleasures of those books is the uh, the Earth President um, Shura Agdashlu. Yes, and he's so she, good. She. Um, has a mouth on her, as they may say. She she can swear up a storm, <laughs> and so when they brought that first to to uh, it was on was it on Fox? Is that where it, uh, it was on uh, Sci Fi? Sci okay, Sci Fi. Of course, her language got cleaned up. So I haven't watched it uh, while it's on Amazon Prime. Have they let her be her? <laughs> let Shura be Shura. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's, it's it's great, it, uh, you know. Language notwithstanding, I loved it. You know, I wanted to actually. Uh, we're talking about science fiction, but if you do need escapism and you do love genre stuff, and you have Netflix and you haven't seen it, and it's kind of on some level a guilty pleasure, 
But if you can imagine an L.A. police procedural where the investigative associate is the devil, um, Lucifer, which began on Fox as an adaptation of Neil Gaiman's Lucifer character from the Sandman comic books at D.C., um, has it just it, it just seduced me, uh, largely in part to its cast, a wonderful cast led by Tom Ellis, who is the suavest guy on TV, playing Lucifer Morningstar, the devil himself, banished uh, to hell, and he gets out uh, to uh, basically uh, counter his father, God, and he moves to Los Angeles, which of course is a little bit of hell here on earth at times, and ends up uh, falling in with a lovely ex-B-movie actress turned police detective, and uh, he is he kind of falls for her and ends up helping her as a creative consultant uh, on her various murder cases, while at the same time trying to figure out his place in the uh, biblical universe. Uh, it, it sounds absurd. I think this might be one of those shows where when you describe it, you sound like a lunatic, but I'm sure it's <laughs> very good when you watch it. It is so entertaining. And uh, I thought that Tom Ellis should be odds on favorite to uh, follow Daniel Craig in the role of James Bond. He's that suave. And he's a hell of a, of a crooner and pianist. And they actually allowed Lucifer, who owns his own nightclub in Hollywood, which is, of course, a, uh, a pit of sex and, and good times and, and craziness. Um, they allow him to perform occasionally a song in context, and it never feels grafted on. And the supporting cast is a wonderful multicultural cast. I, I can't even it was it was so shocking that I fell in love with this show. And yet it's now on Netflix in its entirety. It moved from Fox and they're producing new episodes. And there is a massive fan base uh, globally for this show. And if you haven't seen Tom Ellis do his thing, take five minutes and watch him. He's Sorry, I'm a traditionalist. The only type of music that my demons are allowed to play is classical violin, just <laughs> FYI. Not, not heavy metal, not death metal. Maybe if I'm in Sweden. <laughs> okay, we've got a couple questions from the audience. One asks, "What do you think of Outlander, and and has it lost its luster, uh, or does it still have legs?" I think they're kind of referring to the fact that uh, creator Ron Moore has left. Any thoughts on Outlander? Who watches Outlander on this panel? I'm very curious. I swear to God, I don't, and I love crazy time traveling genre stuff. <laughs> no one ever. Yeah, I watched the first season and that was even like a forcing myself to watch situation. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> that would not be a recommendation, folks. Okay, well, someone else asks, this might or might not be down uh, for any of you, any recommendations for some good blood and guts violent thrillers? He suggests uh, Chernobyl Diaries, Criminal Minds. You know, uh, we should mention here that because that, we really haven't talked about unscripted very much at all. Uh, but uh, we we are right now in a golden age of not just podcasting, true crime podcasting, but true crime documentary series. Um, we will oh, not no. talk. Are you going to mention the we Tiger will not King? talk about the TK oh. show on Netflix right now because everybody else is, and I'm under strict orders not to talk about that. But uh, <laughs> it is just the latest kind of go crazy sort of. Uh, uh, true crime thing. Uh, one that I watched on FX that I just I uh, I thought was astounding was uh, the most dangerous animal of all, uh, which is based on a New York Times uh, best-selling book about a, a guy, a real guy, uh, the true story, um, who was adopted as a child, and when he went back to find his family roots, was absolutely convinced that his father was the Zodiac killer who was like a notorious serial killer in California in the 1960s. And he, um, he documented this quest and then they came in and they made a documentary series about it. And so in the first two hours, they set, spend basically letting him tell his story and that's chilling enough. And then they spend three and four basically pulling it apart. And that's also just sp spellbinding. Um, but then there's just all kinds of, I mean, there's just all kinds of true life documentary, uh, particularly the Netflix audience seems to have a bottomless appetite for uh, this kind of unscripted television. And once you begin to watch any one of these, um, you, you, trust me, the recommendation robot will will just give you, you know, yeah. 
I don't care how long this quarantine goes on. It will give you <laughs> nightly viewing from 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 this point on. Very good. And it's I all hate- extremely good. Uh, uh, I mean, the production values are extremely good. This is not like 48 hours. This is like good stuff. Okay, Ingo? I hate true crime, but I'm going to make two recommendations that the caller probably will not appreciate because they're both comedies. Um, but they're both sort of grisly in their own way. One is Barry, the HBO comedy about a Excellent. ex-essentially uh, Malaysi hitman uh, who is played by, oh, I am blanking. Bill Hader. Bill Hader, Bill thank Hader. you. The other is a mockumentary on FX called What We Do in the Shadows. Oh, yes. And Excellent. basically, it's based on the Taika Waititi movie, What We Do in the Shadows, about a bunch of loser vampires. It is coming back in a couple of seasons, so now would be a perfect time to watch both the movie and the TV show. The, t- the TV show has a bunch of, um, I think the actors are different, and also the um, premise and sort of like the tone of it is a little bit different, and so the TV show very much feels like its own mm-hmm thing yeah um, and yet, so and yet w- they Excellent. connect some of the characters from the movie onto the tv show it's- yes a star wars fan would love it sorry <laughs> a star trek i actually did the thing i know it's very much do. like picard no hey and i'm so <laughs> glad i'm glad you brought up what we do in the shadows because i want to put a big uh you know endorsement of matt berry who plays one of the vampires on what we do in the shadows and his show Toast of London is one of the funniest things I've seen in the past 20 years. Uh, There are, I believe, three or four short, I think three short series available on Netflix right now from the UK. And he plays Stephen Toast, the most arrogant and inept actor in all of London, the most smug uh, and uh, self-serving you could ever imagine. Kind of like an Alan Partridge type. He has rivals and lovers and um, and uh, John Hamm is in series three of it, by the way, playing himself. But Matt Berry uh, is uh, an absolute comic find. And Toast of London um, shocked me. Uh, Robert Lloyd, the uh, TV critic here uh, on the West Coast, he's based out of Los Angeles, recommended it to my friend Hugh. Hugh said, you've got to watch this thing. And literally, I laugh out loud a couple times every episode. Toast of London. Um, and he also right now has a new show on uh, that's called Year of the Rabbit, where he plays um, a, a smug uh, and rather uh, inept detective in London's White Castle district um, in the era of Jack the Ripper. Uh, and that just started here in the States as well. It's called um, Year of the Rabbit. And it's more conventional because Toast of London is fully absurd. It's almost surreal in what it does. But let me tell you, Matt Berry. What We Do in the Shadows, Toast of London, Year of the Rabbit. Who is this guy? Go find out. Okay. Uh, someone in the audience asked us to repeat, where do they find the plot against America? Where's that airing? That's HBO. on HBO. That's HBO? on HBO. Okay. Uh, uh, by the way, um, can I also mention USA's Briar Patch as a kind of, an, uh, if you're interested in true uh, sort of crime and um, n- n- kind of noirish TV, and then if you don't mind a guy who's watched a lot of Twin Peaks, then taking that genre and shaking it up, uh, and putting Rosario Dawson in the in the role and basing it on a novel by an author nobody remembers anymore, watch Briar Pratch. J. R. Ferguson, uh, whom we all loved from uh, Mad Men, is uh, is kind of her. She comes back to her hometown in Texas. J. R. Ferguson is kind of a big shot there because of arms deals he's doing with some foreign power. Anyway, it's way too complicated, even if we had another hour for this, to, to explain. But uh, uh, the creator of the show, Andy Greenwald, also a TV critic, uh, had so much fun uh, uh, creating this and mashing a bunch of things together. Not everything quite works. Some, some, um, some of the episodes are kind of wobbly, but Rosario Dawson pulls a lot of the, uh, of the weight on this show really fun really worth watching it's on usa so actual cable tv um and that's briar patch so the, uh, that the the callers uh, uh might might enjoy enjoy that a lot okay well we actually don't have another hour to go we are in fact out of time so i'm just gonna and i had said we were going to get into movies and television obviously we never even got around to movies so let me make that the exit question for each of you what's one or two great movies whether they're they're current ones i mean there are 
brand new releases that are streaming now because of the shutdown or a classic? Just start with you, Ingo. What, what would you suggest people take a look at? Um, the very last great movie that I saw in, I guess, a sort of like theatrical venue was a movie called First Cow by Kelly Reichardt. And um, I love like a modern take on a Western, which this absolutely is. It's about two men who are sort of like the not super macho men in an Oregon Western town. And basically... A like the first cow, like among, I guess, like the first cow in Oregon comes to their town. And uh, basically, one of the men is obsessed with trying to make business out of this cow, even though the cow does not own, like belong to him. And the other one has the skills to make the business. I am not describing this movie very well, but if this movie, if, but if no other movie is released this year and this movie gets the best picture oscar next year i would be more than happy and kelly reichardt has uh, worked for so long in sort of relative obscurity that i think this is really her big shot um and i hope it comes out on streaming soon very good the other movie i would recommend is um another movie that sort of had its theatrical run cut off uh with the coronavirus which is autumn the wild's emma uh, which is obviously a new adaptation of the uh, Jane Austen novel. And she it's weirdly very, very funny, um, which is, of course, what you always want. But she, I think she captures a lot of that, like, fizziness that you want from an Emma adaptation with a really strong uh, lead performance um, with Anna Taylor-Joy and a really, really strong supporting uh, performance by Mia Goth, who plays her Goonie friend, Harriet. And um, if this ever comes back into theaters, it's a movie that you should watch on the big screen if possible. Like you would want to take every single detail of that movie like and inject it into your eyeballs. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, Michael. biscuits. By the way, biscuits are the thing. Uh, with first cow. It's all about the biscuits. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we could talk about movies that are more high profile that people know that they can get uh, their comfort food blast from. I will mention um, three uh, movies that actually have uh, female leads that I thought were fantastic that are available online and are relatively new. Did not see theatrical release of any great nature prior to the, uh, the shutdown. One is called Blow the Man Down, and it's basically a film noir, uh, wildly entertaining, and the great Margot Martindale, who some people might know uh, as uh, one of the Russian handlers in the uh, terrific uh, dramatic series, The Americans, um, and also as the voice of Ma Beagle on DuckTales, a personal favorite of mine. And let's not forget the, let's not forget Justified. No, we can't forget Margot Martindale and Justified. She plays the local madam of a main, rocky main coast seaside town uh, brothel. And two sisters uh, are burying their mom and uncover in the process a lot of the secrets about the relationships between a bunch of the women in the small town. Annette O'Toole plays one of the older women. Oh, my God, I better check my heart. Uh, and on and on and on. Uh, it's a pretty wonderful film. Swallow, about a young uh, wife who seems to have it all uh, is in uh, Diary of a Mad Housewife territory. Uh, she begins swallowing small objects. Uh, Haley Bennett, who has been off the scene for a little while, is absolutely magnificent uh, in a very subtle way uh, throughout Swallow. Uh, and it's about a real thing, a, a real syndrome where people feel compelled to swallow things. She has the perfect life, the perfect husband, the perfect home, but something's wrong. Uh, and thirdly, um, here's a charmer. Banana Split is one of the best um, coming of age uh, kind of uh, between the last year of high school and the first year of college uh, movies I've seen about uh, kind of a uh, sort of scruffy, re rebellious, but uh, ultimately charming young woman uh, who breaks up with her uh, longtime boyfriend. And that summer meets the girl that he's with now and they become good friends, despite the fact that there should be a lot of anger and jealousy uh, it's a it's a terrific film. Believe me, Banana Split, shocked about it. And if you want to go for the classics, type in Preston Sturgis in your little uh, yes. box on any of these streaming services. And if you can watch The Lady Eve, 
The Palm Beach Story, or my personal favorite film of all time, Sullivan's Travels. These are classics in black and white. They're, they're life-affirming. They're wonderful. They're funny. You know that whole thing, you'll laugh, you'll cry? Preston Sturgis was the man that that phrase was, was built upon. His movies were just fantastic and hold up beautifully today. Get over that whole, oh, it's black and white. Oh, it's from the 30s or 40s. That'll definitely give you uh, the, the strength to go on, people. As Very you good. Say. Very good. And Aaron, your last words. Yes, last words. So um, I'm not a, um, a movie go goer, uh, you know, uh, but I am a uh, I would point out that most of these limited series that you're starting to see now on uh, Netflix and Hulu, these things that are in four or five or six parts. Most of those were movie scripts that uh, got dusted off and turned into um, multi hour epics back in the 70s. We used to call them miniseries. But I want to leave uh, everybody here with just two, what I think are the two outstanding um, kind of services where you can watch uh, a, a bunch of movies that we would never have time to cover here. Uh, and uh, the best part about it is one is cheap and the other is free. So let's start with the cheap one, PBS Passport. Uh, this is the streaming service uh, of PBS and it's available to anybody who pledges $60 a year, that's five bucks a month, to their local PBS station. They can then unlock a vault online and through the PBS app on their Apple TV or Roku devices where they can watch a whole library of PBS films, the entire oeuvre of Ken Burns, for example, uh, or even just little documentaries that, that show once on your local PBS station and they're, then they're gone. Like uh, this, this great documentary called Cooked, Survival by Zip Code, which is about the 1995 Chicago heat wave, an epic disaster that we all forgot about and which mm -hmm. is extremely relevant today. Yeah. That's So you can get that through PBS Passport. And the best thing is when you pledge $60 a month, you're not supporting some, some service way out a million miles away. You're supporting your local TV station, your local PBS public media station. And then the second thing is if you have a library card, the chances are very good that your library subscribes to a service called Canopy. That's Canopy with a K, A-N-O-P-Y. And this is a haven of art films, foreign films, educational films. They have the, the entire great courses collection. So all those, you know, those things where professors lecture to you, uh, but also just like the, the, the whole Criterion collection, which is a really fabulous cultivated set of, of uh, foreign films, all the great classics. And um, during this uh, um, great national, uh, you know, what we call national uh, stay at home month, uh, these libraries are extending the number of credits, the number of downloads that you can have every month with your library card. It's absolutely free. They give you a certain number of credits a month. This month it's 20. So that's a lot of film. That's basically one download every night of the week. You can pick and choose a lot of great variety there. So that's Canopy with a K. And um, so if, 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 you, if you didn't get enough from the three of us uh, in this last hour, uh, go there because uh, those, those are really great services as well. Great. Well, I want to thank our three panelists today, Aaron Barnhart, Ingu Kang, and Michael Snyder. And thank you all for watching us. Thanks for sending in questions. We had more than I was able to even work into our discussion. Uh, and hopefully you've uh, jotted down some notes on things you want to check out. So have a good rest of your week and follow us for more on commonwealthclub.org slash online. Bye.